Hello, in this video we're going to continue our exploration of Rust by looking at scalar variables in Rust. At this point I've read through the documentation on scalar variables, never used a Rust variable in my life, and I'm about to try. We're going to look at basic handling of variables, and we're going to look at the different scalar types available in Rust. And I have to say that so far, just from looking at the documentation, there are some real surprises in there. So first I need a new project, I'll use Cargo. And I've rigged up some keyboard shortcuts in Visual Studio Code so I can increase my font size. So let's do that a bit. And here I'm going to do Cargo New, I'll call this Variables. So we should be able to open this. Let's take a look. Here it is. And let's increase the font size there as well. So to create variables in Rust, the most common way apparently is to use the let keyword. So let's say, for example, let x equal 10, semicolon. I assume it won't compile without that. Let's try it without. And then a question I always have when I come to a new programming language is, how do you insert variables into strings? Is there any kind of variable interpolation? And apparently there is. Let's write print line, and I'll just put value, comma, and then in curly brackets, we'll just put x. Let's try compiling this. I don't think it will compile. So I'm going to just do cargo run, and that's going to invoke build if it's not already built. Yeah, I've got to change into the directory though. Let's try that. Cargo run. Evidently, we do need the semicolons. That's good to know. And I've also forgotten something here. I've forgotten this exclamation mark. Okay, let's try again. I don't know why that exclamation mark's there. I think I read something about it being a macro. We are going to find out in due course. Okay, so it ran, because it says down here, value 10. Now there are a couple of surprises already at this point. Let's get rid of the terminal for the moment. So one thing is we can't reassign this variable. It's not, strictly speaking, a variable. Let's try x equals 9 and see what happens. Probably shouldn't have actually got rid of that terminal. Let's go back again. Okay, so cargo run, and it tells me that I cannot assign twice to immutable variable x. So that's pretty crazy. But what I can do, which practically no other language would let you do, is I can just redeclare x like this. According to the documentation, I've never tried this before. Let's give it a go. And it works. So it says value 9. This is apparently called shadowing. So Rust tries to encourage you to use immutable variables, which can't be changed, by making those the default kind of variable when you use let. But I suppose this shadowing, where we can redeclare the variable with the same name, creating a new variable, is a kind of way around that, which again kind of encourages you not to bother creating mutable variables. You can create mutable variables though. We do that with the mute keyword. Let's have a go. So I'm going to do let mute y equal 20. And then we'll see if we can change it. Let's say y equals 15 and print line exclamation mark. Let's say here y is curly brackets y. And here I'm going to change this actually to x is whatever that is. Okay, so let's run this. Yeah, I've forgotten some semicolons. Problem is I've been using Kotlin recently and Kotlin just doesn't use semicolons. Neither Python, although you can put them in in Python. Okay, so you can see that that's actually worked. We've got y is 15 down here. None of this is quite like any programming language I've previously used. I suppose it does suggest a rather innovative approach and it makes me even more curious to see what else the designers of Rust have come up with. I have no idea who the designers are, I'm going to have to look into that. Now, as you can see, the Rust compiler will usually infer the type from the variable, but there may be circumstances where you want to definitely fix on a particular type or the compiler can't infer the type and we can't explicitly specify the type. Rust divides variables into scalar variables and compound variables. And since the compound variables include arrays and tuples, tuples you'll be familiar with if you know Python, 
I thought I'd save that for the next video because otherwise this is going to get really long. We're just going to look at the scalar types here. So let's say here, let, I'll call this value one equal, and we'll make this a integer like 12. So to specify the type, we can do that again in a syntax similar to Kotlin. I don't know which came first with a colon after the variable. I think this might come from Pascal, although I've never used Pascal. And we could write here, for example, i8. So that's an 8-bit integer. Let's also print it. So value 1 is value 1. And let's run this. I've got a, a real problem has entered my head with missing semicolons here. The first language I learned was QBasic and then C++, so I am used to these semicolons. It's just Kotlin's got me out of the habit. So it says value is 12. And we've got a bunch of other types here. Let's create a bunch of just variables called value just to try them out. Don't know how many we're going to need. I'll give them different names as well. Let's make this value two, three, four, five, and six. So we've got, in addition to an 8-bit integer, obviously we're not limited to that. That's going to be signed, so we could even make it minus 12. We've also got, now, can I remember this? 16-bit, I think, yeah. It goes up in powers of two, of course. 32-bit integers, which I believe are the default. 64-bit integers, and something I've never seen before, 128-bit integers. We've also got a Boolean type, and in Rust, Boolean literals have a lowercase first letter, true or false, like they do in C++ or Java, if I'm not getting confused. We've got a character type as well. Let's duplicate that. So just Option, Shift, Down Arrow, or Alt, Shift, Down Arrow, I suppose, on Windows. And that's called char, like in C++. And like in C++, we can use a single quote to contain a character. This is actually a Unicode type, which is always four bytes in size. And we've also got a size type similar to what we have in C++. So I can write I size here, and let's set that to some number. I'm just gonna check that this actually compiles just to be sure I've not got anything wrong. So I've got some warnings here. It, these are unused variable warnings, which is, is quite nice. And it says if I intentionally want to create variables that I'm not going to use, I can prefix them with an underscore. How interesting. Let's try that. Now I'm going to rebuild it. We're down to two warnings. OK, it's telling me that Y up here is overwritten before it's read, which is actually a really useful warning. And I've got an unused variable X, apparently, as well. Let's maximize the terminal here so I can figure out what the other warning is. I'm actually just going to clear the screen and run that again. So I've got unused variable x on line 2. So that's the same deal again. I can prefix this with an underscore if I want that warning to go away. I'm going to put a comment in here. I haven't tried comments either. Looks like it's just like C++. Prefixed with underscore because unused. All right, so I assume this program would actually run. Let's just do cargo run. The only warnings I should have left now is just the warning about what I'm doing with X up here. Let's try this. So yeah, it runs and I get output. I was actually wondering if I might have to do something strange with this literal for I size to turn it into a size type, but I don't. The size type is used in C++ basically only, as far as I really know, when you're iterating over a collection like an array. It's architecture dependent, and in Rust, it's either 32 bits if you're on a 32-bit system, but who's still using those? And 64 bits if you're on a 64-bit system. I don't know, maybe some mobile phones are 32-bit. And of course, you're wondering about the floating point types. We've got two of those. Let's duplicate this. And I'll change that to 8 and 9. So we've got two floating point types. We've got F32, 32 bits, and we've got F64. 
I'm curious if this will compile when I'm assigning integers. C++ would just say, okay, that's 54.0. Let's try it. In fact, it doesn't. I've got to use a float literal, which is kind of interesting. Same deal in Coslin, but lots of languages, unless I'm misremembering, really wouldn't mind. Let's try running it again, and it runs. In addition to these, we've also got unsigned versions of these integers and of size, which I suppose is why size is prefixed with I, because the unsigned versions are prefixed with U. So let's just copy this and we'll try a couple of these out. I'm not going to go through all of them. Let's try size and I16. So we should be able to do U16 and U size. Let's try that. Okay, that runs and I shouldn't be able to assign a negative value to that. And indeed we get an error in that case. One thing that people say about Rust is that the error reporting is really nice. I think in C++ and C in particular, especially like in the 1990s, the error reporting was sometimes just absolutely awful. You get these enormous error reports sometimes, and quite often they will be horribly cryptic. And it seems that whoever created Rust has really fixed that problem. There's one last thing that I think we should cover here, and that is constants. Because you might think that, well, if by default a variable created with let cannot be changed, then we don't need constants. But the designers of Rust have decided that we do in fact need constants. Let's create one at the top here. We create constants with the const keyword. So let's create a const pi and set that equal to 3.141 how I wish I could calculate pi. That's the number of letters in uh, those words that corresponds to uh, pi. How I wish I could calculate pi. And we need the semicolon. So that ought to work. And I assume I can print it out as well. Let's just try here. So pi is pi. So I'm using uppercase letters, which is the convention in most programming languages and also Rust. Well, apparently I here I've got to provide a type for it and it suggests F64, which is a fair enough suggestion. So let's type in F64 and try again. And it runs. So why do we need constants at all? Well, I tried to do a little bit of reading on this on Stack Overflow. I'm not sure in total what all the advantages are. But one of them is that constants are assign their value at compile time. You can't, for example, shadow a constant. So I don't think Rust would let me do let pi equal something else. Let's just verify that this indeed doesn't work. Yeah. And what's actually the error here? So it actually says this was previously accepted by the compiler, but is being phased out. Floating point types cannot be used in patterns. Well, that is a little bit cryptic, but it does highlight the problematic line. Let's just take a look in full at the error here. Can't really tell where the last one ends and this one starts. So let's clear the screen, maybe put a few blank lines in and run it again. Okay, so floating point types cannot be used in patterns. Well, we'll find out what that means in time. But it does highlight the line. It does mention something about a constant. And then there's a load of stuff that I don't really understand. But that's good enough for me. Let's get rid of that. Let's just try with the const keyword and see what happens as well. Then I'm going to have to wind up this video because this is getting ridiculous. Let's try that. Yeah, it won't let me do that either. So that is one definite advantage of a constant. Well, two actually. They're assigned at compile time. That name is always going to be fixed to this value in every possible way. And you can't shadow them like we can with variables here. OK, so let's take a look at all the code we've got today. <laughs> That's the code for today. And as always, if you want to watch the video without adverts and you want to see a write up of this, if you go to blog.caveofprogramming.com, link in the description, unless you're already on there, of course, then you can see this in a written form. You can Click through to see the code on GitHub. 
and you can watch the video without any interruptions. Until next time, happy coding.